From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! These peaceful demonstrators posed no threats whatsoever to Israel or its heavily armed soldiers. Yet, its trigger-happy soldiers used live ammunition, tear gas, and rubber bullets to shoot indiscriminately at those non-violent protesters. At least 18 Palestinians were killed and as many as 1,700 wounded Friday after Israeli forces opened fire with live bullets on a protest near Gaza's border with Israel. Israel's refusing to investigate the killings. We'll go to Gaza, Haifa, and Washington for the latest. Then to Memphis, where 50 years ago this week, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. He was in Memphis supporting striking sanitation workers. You are reminding not only Memphis, but you are reminding the nation that it is a crime for people to live in this rich nation and receive starvation wages. We'll speak to labor leader Bill Lucy, who helped organize the 1968 Memphis sanitation workers' strike, and H.B. Crockett, one of the last surviving sanitation workers who took part in the strike. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In the Gaza Strip, at least 18 Palestinians were killed, as many as 1,700 wounded Friday, after Israeli forces opened fire with live bullets on a protest near Gaza's eastern border with Israel. Video posted online shows unarmed Palestinians being shot in the back as they fled from tear gas and gunfire. The deaths and injuries came as 30,000 Gaza residents gathered near the wall as part of a planned six-week-long nonviolent protest against the blockade of Gaza and to demand the right of return for Palestinian refugees. This is Gaza resident Abed al Khadr al Haddad. They are hoping. They say that the old will die and the young will forget. However, no, the young are children sitting here, saying that they want to go back to their families' lands, the lands of their fathers and grandfathers. They want to go back. The young have more ambition, more than their fathers and grandfathers. Another 49 Palestinians were injured by Israeli forces during protests Saturday. Israel's actions have been condemned around the world, but Israel's rejecting calls to investigate the killings. Meanwhile, at the United United Nations, the U.S. blocked a move by the U.N. Security Council that called for an investigation. After headlines, we'll go to Gaza, to Haifa and to Washington, D.C., for the latest on Israel's bloody crackdown on protests. President Trump has declared DACA dead dimming the prospects for hundreds of thousands of young undocumented immigrants who were granted permission under the Deferred Action Against Childhood Arrivals program to live and work in the United States. In a tweet early this morning, Trump wrote, quote, DACA is dead because the Democrats didn't care or act, and now everyone wants to get onto the DACA bandwagon, no longer works, must build wall and secure our borders with proper border legislation. Democrats want no borders, hence drugs and crime." Unquote. Trump's latest tweet followed a flurry of attacks on DACA on Sunday. Easter, in which Trump also threatened to cancel NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, unless Mexico helps pay for a wall along its border with the U.S. Trump also called for Senate Republicans to end the filibuster and complained of caravans heading to the U.S. That was an apparent reference to a migrant caravan of about 1,100 people organized by the group People Without Borders, which is currently in Oaxaca and bound for the U.S. The migrants are fleeing rampant violence and economic deprivation in their home countries. Most of them are from Honduras, where the U.S.-backed President Juan Orlando Hernandez was recently inaugurated for a second term, despite allegations of widespread election fraud in the November election. This is Jose Avila Luna, who says he was forced to flee Honduras amidst per political turmoil following the election. 
Los políticos quieren tapar las cosas. Politicians want to cover things up. They steal elections. It's a mess in my country. Regarding politics, it is a mess. Regarding the basic cost of living, the price of electricity is through the roof in comparison to the local currency. In Sacramento, a 61-year-old woman was struck by a police vehicle Saturday as she joined protests against the police killing of Stefan Clark, an unarmed African-American man who died after he was shot by police officers 20 times in his grandmother's backyard last month. Wanda Cleveland was treated at a local hospital for injuries to her wrist and head after she was struck by a police cruiser being driven by a sheriff's deputy. The incident was filmed by legal observer Guy Danilowitz of the National Lawyers Guild. I saw a vehicle essentially uh, strike a protester who was looking like she was trying to get out the way, and uh, the vehicle a sheriff's deputy was stopped and accelerated forward violently, as the video shows, and struck her. Um, and I called 911 because of the force with which she got struck. Uh, and then the patrol vehicles, after striking her, it was loud. Everyone heard it. Uh, they just sped off. Saturday's protest came as a forensic pathologist, hired by Stefan Clark's family, determined that Clark was struck repeatedly in the back by police gunfire. This is Dr. Bennett Omalu. Six of the bullets, like you could see in the body diagram, exhibited gunshot wounds of entrance in the back, meaning he was shot in the back. Dr. Amalu said the evidence contradicted police claims that Clark was fired upon as he advanced towards officers. Police initially said they believed Clark had a firearm when he was shot. The department later said the officers believed at the time Clark was holding a toolbar. Clark was found to have only a cell phone on him at the time of his death. In Yemen, a huge fire tore through a warehouse belonging to the United Nations World Food Program Saturday, incinerating food, fuel and other supplies bound for victims of a three-year civil war. Among supplies destroyed by the fire were hundreds of thousands of mattresses meant for people made homeless by the U.S.-backed Saudi-led bombing campaign against Houthi rebels. The war has devastated Yemen's health, water and sanitation systems, sparking a massive cholera outbreak and pushing millions of Yemenis to the brink of starvation. In Indian-administered Kashmir, at least 20 people have died and 70 others were wounded over the weekend as clashes erupted between government forces and pro-independence militias. Among those reportedly killed were three Indian soldiers and 13 militants. Meanwhile, in Srinagar, a curfew remains in effect today, after police opened fire with live rounds on thousands of demonstrators protesting for an end to Indian rule, killing four people and wounding dozens of others. In Costa Rica, Carlos Alvarado Quesada has claimed victory in a presidential election that was widely seen as a referendum on marriage equality. Alvarado Quesada won over 60 percent of the vote, beating out conservative candidate Fabricio Alvarado Munoz, who made his anti-abortion views and opposition to LGBTQ rights a centerpiece of his campaign. Alvarado Quesada promised to abide by last year's ruling by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that member countries should respect marriage equality. China has imposed tariffs of up to 25 percent on $3 billion worth of U.S. food imports in retaliation for President Trump's plans to levy tariffs on Chinese products. Trump announced the U.S. tariffs last month after tweeting, quote, trade wars are good and easy to win. Former U.S. Veterans Affairs Secretary David Shulkin said Sunday he was fired unexpectedly by President Trump, directly contradicting claims by the White House that he resigned, which would determine who would temporarily succeed him. This is David Shulkin speaking on NBC's Meet the Press. I came to fight for our veterans, and I had no intention of giving up. Uh, there would be no reason for me to resign. I made a commitment. I took an oath, and I was here to fight for our veterans. 
of men. David Shulkin has been speaking out on many networks in a move not seen by other Trump officials who've been ousted. Dr. Shulkin says he was fired over his opposition to privatizing the VA, an effort that's been led by a group called Concerned Veterans for America, which is funded by the billionaire conservative Koch brothers. President Trump has nominated White House physician Dr. Ronnie Jackson to replace Shulkin, while appointing Pentagon official Robert Wilkie as acting head of the VA. But legal experts say that if Dr. Shulkin was fired, Trump's move may have violated federal law by bypassing Shulkin's deputy, who was next in line to succeed him. The Justice Department has demoted the head of its death penalty unit after The New York Times investigated reports that he promoted favoritism, gender bias and a sexualized environment in the workplace. The Times cites interviews with more than a half dozen current and former employees who say Kevin Canwile fostered a toxic climate rife with sexual harassment. In one alleged incident, Carwile looked on as a deputy groped an administrative assistant in view of several colleagues and later told his employees to keep it a secret. Several employees say they complained about the abuses for years without a meaningful response. In Washington, D.C., hundreds of Howard University students are occupying their campus's main administrative building for a fifth straight day today, in a protest that began amidst reports that university employees misappropriated a million dollars in financial aid funds in a possible case of embezzlement. The students are demanding that President Wayne Frederick and the executive committee of the Board of Trustees resign over the scandal. They're also demanding more action to prevent sexual assault on campus. The arming of campus police and adequate housing at the historically black university. In Oklahoma, tens of thousands of school teachers have called a strike and are set to rally at the state capitol today as they protest for higher wages and a reversal to a decade of Republican-led cuts to public education. Last week, Governor Mary Fallon signed a bill bringing teachers a $6,100 pay raise and other benefits. The Oklahoma Education Association has said the measure is welcome but does not go far enough in a state where teachers are among the lowest paid in the country. Meanwhile, school districts in parts of Kentucky are closed again today, after thousands of teachers in Kentucky began calling in sick last Friday. The wildcat strike comes after Republican lawmakers rammed through legislation last week that dramatically cuts retirement benefits for public employees. The pension rollback came as part of an amendment to a nearly 300-page bill about sewer system regulations. It was passed in a matter of hours on Thursday, with no public hearings, and before most lawmakers had a chance to read it. As the legislation sped through Kentucky's House and Senate, hundreds of teachers protested inside the state capitol, chanting, vote them out. This is Kentucky Education Association President Stephanie Winkler. This year's wave of teacher rebellions began in West Virginia, where teachers won a 5 percent pay raise after an historic strike. The protests have also inspired teachers in other states, including Arizona, where union members are threatening to strike unless their demand for a 20 percent wage increase is met. In Guatemala, the former U.S.-backed dictator Efrain Rios Montt died on Sunday at the age of 91. In 2013, Rios Montt was convicted and sentenced to 80 years in prison on genocide charges over a massacre in 1982 that killed 273 indigenous Guatemalans, nearly half of them children. That same year, President Ronald Reagan praised Rios Montt as a, quote, man of great personal integrity and commitment. This is Nobel Peace Laureate Rigoberta Menchu speaking on Democracy Now! Just just after Rios Montt's conviction on genocide charges nearly five years ago. This verdict is historic. It's monumental. The verdict against Rios Montt is historic. We waited for 33 years for justice to be—to prevail. 
It's clear that there is no peace without justice. There is no peace without truth. Uh, we need justice for the victims for there to be real peace. This verdict is crucial. Um, it complements a long process of investigation, of denouncing the abuses, and a process that the victims hope will heal and result in reparations. A Guatemalan court annulled General Rios Montt's sentence less than two weeks after his conviction in 2013. But last year, a court opened a new genocide trial for Rios Montt, along with his former intelligence chief, Mauricio Rodriguez Sanchez. That trial was still underway at the time of Rios Montt's death yesterday. Declassified U.S. government documents show that between the 60s and 80s, the CIA trained the Guatemalan military in techniques including torture, kidnapping and forced disappearance of dissidents. The repression left some 200,000 people dead, the vast majority of them at the hands of Guatemalan government forces. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today's show in Gaza, where 18 Palestinians have died after Israeli forces opened fire Friday on a protest near the Gaza Strip's eastern border with Israel. As many as 1,700 Palestinians were wounded. The deaths and injuries came as 30,000 Gaza residents gathered near the wall as part of a planned six-week-long nonviolent protest against the blockade of Gaza and to demand the right of return for Palestinian refugees. The protest began on Friday, March 30th, which is known as Land Day. The annual event marks the anniversary of the March 30th, 1976 killing of six Palestinians protesting the Israeli uh, confiscation of Arab land. Video posted online shows unarmed Palestinians being shot in the back while taking part in Friday's protest. Another 49 Palestinians were injured by Israeli forces on Saturday. Israel's actions have been condemned around the world, but Israel is rejecting calls to investigate the killings. Meanwhile, at the United Nations, the U.S. blocked a move by the U.N. Security Council to open an investigation. Riyad Mansour, the Palestinian ambassador to the United Nations, condemned Israel's actions. These peaceful demonstrators posed no threats whatsoever to Israel or its heavily armed soldiers. Yet, its trigger-happy soldiers used live ammunition, tear gas, and rubber bullets to shoot indiscriminately at those nonviolent protesters who were demonstrating inside the Gaza Strip near their side of the well-fortified barrier that separates them from Israel. How could that be condoned? Israel has defended its use of lethal force. Captain Karen Hajoff of the head of public diplomacy in the Israel Defense Forces. What we've seen over the last 24 hours is anything other than a peaceful protest. What we've seen is a violent riot in its clearest form. The Hamas terrorist organization have sent their people here to camouflage their true intentions. And we've seen that on the ground just behind where I'm standing right now. We go first to Gaza City, uh, to attorney Raji Sarani, director of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights in Gaza. He received the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award in 1991. He was also twice named an Amnesty International Prisoner of Conscience. Raji Sarani, take us back to Land Day, to Friday, and talk about what took place. Gazans, after 11 years of criminal, illegal, and inhuman siege, which suffocated Gaza socially and economically, and after three wars where Israel uh, was targeting in the eye of the storm uh, the Palestinian civilians and civilian targets, uh, and, and, and this time where Israel didn't allow uh, rebuilding Gaza and denied us from our basic rights, I mean, did that level we are not able to treat our water or our sewage. Uh, 
uh, Gaza after 11 years of uh, siege, having 65 percent unpaid or unemployed, uh, having 90 percent under poverty line, and 85 percent uh, depends on underwaration. So they shifted us to be a nation of beggars in a biggest man-made disaster. Uh, two million people are crippled, not because we are lazy. We have one of the highest percent of university graduates, and we have one of the most fantastic uh, skilled workers, and we have no illiteracy. Uh, but with that, they didn't allow us to function normally, and they decided to disconnect us from the West Bank and from the outside world, and invested all reasons to make Gaza uh, really, I mean, ISIS space, where people lose hope, no future, and no opportunity for uh, any level or by any chance. So, so people wanted after all this conspiracy of silence, after all this pain and suffering, uh, to demonstrate for their dignity, for their uh, right of having an end for this criminal, illegal, inhuman seed, which all international human rights organizations, all UN bodies, and all world civil society denied and denounced and condemned Israel of practicing it. Uh, they just wanted to have an outcry. We have, we want to have an end. We want to be free. We want to have, uh, you, you know, access to the outside world. We want to be normal. Uh, this is incredible what's going on, and people just decided to resort in land day to a peaceful means, peaceful demonstration. And they went in hundreds of thousands, men, women, young, old, from early morning. Everybody marched and went to specific points designated by the political parties to demonstrate that. And all political parties declared and committed themselves to have it clearly, peacefully. I personally was there. I was on the border with the people from the early morning. I can assure you 100 percent what I have seen, what I witnessed, what I felt, what all our field workers across the Gaza Strip felt and watched and, and noticed that this was 100 percent peaceful demonstrations. Nothing, nothing violent had happened. All people were away from the fence, tens of meters, between 50 to 100 meters at least. And the Israeli soldiers on the other side, 100 to 150. I can assure you one harvest of this day. Not a single Israeli soldier were hurt or injured or shocked. But we have almost 1,500 people injured many of them in critical conditions. Many of those in critical conditions are children. And we have 16 killed that day. We are talking about purely civilians, people, peaceful demonstration. It was very costly, and Israel wanted to provoke people to have the red flag for the Gazan Toro, to retaliate, to retaliate in a violent way. But people were committed to this notion, peaceful, peaceful demonstration, and they wanted to show their moral superiority on criminal, aggressive occupation who do flagrantly war crimes and crimes against humanity on the daylight. This was on the record in front of the media. It wasn't a mean hide. And I challenge if Israel can prove one single violent act was taken by the demonstrators at that day. It right. was for us day of pride and day of challenge for this anniversary of 50 years of criminal occupation.
Raji Sarani, we're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Raji Sarani, award-winning human rights lawyer, activist, director of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights in Gaza. He is on the executive board of the International Federation for Human Rights, a Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award winner. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we'll continue our discussion about what took place in Gaza. It's believed 18 people killed by Israeli forces on Friday, more than a thousand wounded. Stay with us. Has Fallen Down by Rim Bana, a Palestinian musician who recently died of cancer. Bana has performed all over the world, calling for the end of the Palestinian occupation. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we continue to look at the crisis in Gaza, where 18 Palestinians were killed after Israeli forces opened fire Friday on a protest near the Gaza Strip's eastern border with Israel. As many as 1,700 Palestinians were wounded. In addition to human rights activist Raji Sarani, director of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights in Gaza City, who was there on Friday. We are also joined by Diana Butu in the Israeli city of Haifa. She has served as a legal advisor to the Palestinians in negotiations with Israel, previously an advisor to Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. And in Washington, D.C., we're joined by the Israeli peace activist and writer Miko Pellet. His father was an Israeli general, a military governor of the Gaza Strip, and a member of parliament. In 1997, his niece was killed in a suicide attack in Jerusalem. Juan? Yeah, I'd like to uh, 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 bring in De uh, Diana Butu to talk about the, the claims of the Israeli Defense Forces, one, that the protesters uh, were turned violent, and also uh, that most of the people killed were young men between the ages of 18 and 30, including several uh, folks that they've identified as Hamas leaders. Could you respond to that portion of what the Israelis have claimed? The Israelis are going to try to claim that this was anything but a peaceful protest, uh, because they have no way of justifying what it is that they did. Um, and I think it's important, Juan, to keep in mind exactly the layout of the Gaza Strip. We've got the Gaza Strip, which is completely fortified on both the north and eastern sides by an electrified fence. And then, in addition to that electrified fence that people cannot pass, um, Israel has imposed a 350-meter, about 1,000-foot a uh, buffer zone that is unmarked in that area as well. And that buffer zone or that no-go zone is an area where if Palestinians go there, uh, it, they will be shot by the, the, the Israeli army. And so their claim is that they were somehow trying to protect Israel. But uh, first, there was no, or there was absolutely no um, sign whatsoever that there was any, any of that sort of thing. And then secondly, the type of, of force and the weaponry that was used, they made it clear from even the day before the protest was taking place, that they were going to use live ammunition to shoot to kill. And they announced as much by saying that they were going to be using and putting forth 100 snipers on the border that day. So the idea that this was somehow not a peaceful protest is simply their uh, attempt at revisionist history. But video footage um, and uh, all the footage that is coming out of Gaza 
has clearly demonstrated the opposite. In terms of the people who were killed, they, there were people, the vast majority of people or all the people who were killed were under the age of 30, because that is the composition of the, the Gaza Strip right now. More than 50 percent of the population is under the age of 18 years of age. So what Israel was shooting at was a child uh, population, the defenseless population, a civilian population, and a refugee population. And they made it very clear that they were shooting to kill, and so they did. On Saturday, the Israeli army tweeted, yesterday we saw 30,000 people. We arrived prepared and with precise reinforcements. Nothing was carried out uncontrolled. Everything was accurate and measured, and we know where every bullet landed. The tweet was later deleted. The Israeli human rights group, Patsalem, said the tweet was akin to saying, Israeli army takes full responsibility for the killing of all unarmed protesters and the injuring of hundreds with live ammunition. Raji Sarani in Gaza, your response to uh, what Israel is saying and uh, the fact that Israel is saying they will not investigate this, despite what the U.N. Security Council is calling for. And my experience for the last uh, 40 years as practicing lawyer in the Israeli uh, legal system, uh, never ever, I mean, they uh, hold accountable anybody, I mean, for crimes, you know, have been committed, vice versa. I mean, even yeah, okay. uh, with the cases we submitted once and again, I mean, uh, all the way long, uh, the Israeli legal system provided full legal cover for organized systematic crimes perpetrated by the Israeli occupation army. On the uh, other side, Israel never cooperated with any investigation committee, ever. Uh, by the UN or any uh, other body. Uh, they only recognize their justice, and they uh, know how to justify uh, for themselves all these willful killings and crimes they are perpetrating against international law. We do act according to very simple formula, supported by international community. There is facts, standards, conclusions. The facts we know. I mean, we are living here, and I think we have enough credibility and professionalism to say this is peaceful demonstration. And Palestinians can be they can be peaceful. We are not terrorists. We are freedom fighters. We are romantic revolutionary. We have absolute legitimate right of be free of occupation. And the history never ever spoke about just or fair occupation. It's vice versa. The Israeli occupation showed uh, by default, I mean, how criminal they are. Now, uh, uh, the demonstrations were peaceful, and the Israeli army, before this Friday, in a clear-cut way, politicians, spokespersons, army spokespersons, uh, and, and different army and security leaders said, we are going to use the snipers. We are going to kill any who come close to the borders, peaceful or not. And these statements are on the record. Believe me, believe me, Amy, I was there. It can be me who was shot and killed or injured. It's your lottery numbers. Snipers are hundreds of meters away, and they are shooting, picking people like Animals, I mean, shooting at them for no reason whatsoever. I mean, you can see people, I mean, falling down among those peaceful demonstrators. Uh, you know, one injured, one killed, one in the back of his head, one in his spine. And, and you don't know, I mean, where your lottery number can be. So Israel really committed very intentionally crime. They did willful killing. Well, uh, Raji, this was uh, in advance has been decided. Uh, Raji Sarani, I'd like to also bring in Miko Pellet, uh, uh, an Israeli peace activist. Uh, wanted to get your response to the uh, to the current violence, and also if you could talk, as you have often talked about the treatment of uh, Palestinians who are who live within Israel, who are Israeli citizens, and yet they are also continue to suffer uh, under Israeli rule. 
Sure, yes. I mean, look, the, the issue here is, is, is a threat to the Israeli legitimacy. As long as this humanitarian catastrophe continues to fester, there is a threat to the story that Israel somehow has legitimacy. And the people who have to pay the price are the Palestinians. And so when they dare to stand and they dare to challenge the claim that Israel has legitimacy, then uh, they have to be shot. The only reason that there's such poverty in the Gaza Strip, the only reason there's such poverty in the Nakab Desert, where Palestinians have Israeli citizenship, the only reason that the Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship are on the lowest, uh, uh, the lowest level, you know, the, the, the very bottom of the, of the economic totem pole within what is called legitimate, is so-called legitimate Israel, is because they are Israel wants them either dead or out. Because as long as they survive, as long as they are there, there's a challenge to the legitimacy of the state of Israel. If the existence of the state of Israel comes at a cost of what we see in Gaza, then there cannot be legitimacy, and this is why they're killing. So the claim that somehow there is a threat to Israel from Gaza, or a threat to Israel from any Palestinians who never had an army, who never had a tank, who never had an F-16 uh, uh, fighter plane, is, a, is nonsense. The threat is that people will see that Israel has no legitimacy, that the price for the establishment and the existence of the state of Israel is Palestinian suffering, is Palestinian refugees, is the ongoing killing of Palestinians, denial of their rights, denial of their right to water and, and, and a normal life. I mean, uh, two million people in Gaza live without access to clean water or medical care. The same goes for Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, who are uh, who, ha who, have, who have no access to clean water and other services. So this, this, it's an insult to the intelligence, really, when they start to claim that somehow this or any of the other Palestinian protests uh, around Palestine at any, at any point in time were somehow a threat. And this nonsense claim that somehow Hamas was behind it and did not declare their intentions, their intentions are very clear. It was a nonviolent protest. It was designed in order to remind people that Palestinians have a right to return, and they want to return to their lands and their homes, the lands from which they, in many cases, they can see from the border uh, of the Gaza Strip. And the bottom line is that we have Palestinians a young Palestinian child in Gaza with a curable disease will die, whereas a young Israeli child a few miles away will live, because Israel has declared it has the right to decide who lives and dies. Me it's, 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 you know, this is the reality. It's a question of legitimacy. Miko Pellet, you're the son of an Israeli general. The uncle of uh, uh, your niece was killed in a suicide bombing um, in Jerusalem. What is the response right now of the Israeli people? I mean, you have this nonviolent demonstration, 18 Palestinians gunned down, um, more than a thousand have been wounded. Look, the, 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 if we want to see what Israeli society thinks, we, all we need to do is look at the makeup of the Israeli Knesset, of the Israeli parliament and the Israeli government, because Israelis vote in very high numbers. So from time to time, as, as in this case, you see a few hundred people protesting there, a few hundred Israelis protesting here. But the vast majority of Israelis support the government, support its actions, and call for more and more violence. They see this as completely justified. If you look at the Israeli press, the narrative is that these were clashes, that there was somehow violent intentions on the part of the Palestinians. They're completely locked in step behind what the government spokespeople are saying. So this is what the Israelis think. Israelis agree to this. They voted for these people. And it's not like it's only Netanyahu. Netanyahu is a broad coalition and broad support all over, you know, the, 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 among politicians, among the press, and among people in the street. It's a very, it's a very, very, uh, it's a very sad state of affairs within Israeli society, because there is support for this. If Israelis wanted to end the siege on Gaza, they could be out there in hundreds of thousands protesting or vote for somebody else. They support this 100 percent. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called for an independent, transparent investigation into the Gaza bloodshed. However, on Sunday, the Israeli defense minister, Avigdor Lieberman, told Israel's public radio uh, that there will not be an inquiry. He said, quote, from the standpoint of the Israeli Defense Force soldiers, they did what they had to be done. I think all of our troops deserve a commendation. Uh, Raji Sarani, can you respond, as we wrap up, what you're calling for and your response to what the Israeli military is saying? I know the victims of 2008, 
2009, and I know the victims of 2012, and I know the victims of 2014. And we know what Israel is doing on a day-to-day basis. Uh, I represent those civilian victims. I represented them all my life. And I know what Israel is doing and what quality and kind of crimes they are doing. Uh, Israel doing ethnic cleansing in Jerusalem for Palestinians, Christians, and Muslims. Israel building a new brand of apartheid in the West Bank. And in Gaza, with the siege, they are doing social economic suffocation. That's the harvest of 25 years of Oslo Accords, which was intended to end by having a Palestinian self-determination independent and state in Gaza, West Bank, and Jerusalem. Uh, Lieberman, first-class criminal, I can assure you one thing. One day, he will stand for justice, and he will be held accountable for all the crimes and orders he gave to those criminal soldiers due to the chain of command. Uh, we, they want to push us for one thing, to give up, to be good victims. Never ever we will give up and we will continue the fight for our freedom, for our dignity, for our people, for our right to be free, to have an end for this criminal occupation in its 50th anniversary. Uh, they want to steal We're tomorrow from us, but tomorrow is ours. Ranji, we sir. are on the right side of history, and that will happen. Irrelevant to what Lieberman is saying, our people so determined to go with this, and these peaceful demonstrations will continue to the day of Nakba in 15th of May, and it will be in 15th of May a big day for Palestinians. In millions, they will be with their friends, supporters, those who support rule of law, democracy, and the human rights, and well, against Raji the rule Sirani. of jungle. Israel is doing. I want to thank you very much for being with us, Director of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights in Gaza. Also, Miko Pella, joining us from Washington, D.C., Israeli peace activist, and Diana Butu, joining us on the phone from Haifa, Palestinian lawyer. This is Democracy Now! When we come back this week marks the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, Tennessee. We go to Memphis. Stay with us. Like a motherly child Sometimes I feel Like a motherly child Sometimes I feel Like a motherly child Alone Freedom, a new beginning by the blind boys of Alabama. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, this week, commemorations are being held to mark the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The civil rights leader and peace activist was gunned down on April 4, 1968, at the balcony of his hotel room at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. He was just 39 years old. King was in Memphis to support striking sanitation workers, who he saw as being on the front lines of fighting poverty and integral to his new initiative, the Poor People's Campaign. In the late 1960s, King recognized that the next phase in the quest for civil rights and equality would focus on the economic divide. 
You are demanding that this city will respect the dignity of labor. So often we overlook the worth and the significance of those who are not in professional jobs, of those who are not in the so-called big jobs. But let me say to you tonight that whenever you are engaged in work that serves humanity and is for the building of humanity, it has dignity and it has worth. You are reminding not only Memphis, but you are reminding the nation that it is a crime for people to live in this rich nation and receive starvation wages. The Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike was sparked by the deaths of two workers, Echo Cole and Robert Walker, who were crushed to death in the back of a faulty garbage truck as they sought shelter from the rain. African-American sanitation workers in Memphis were instructed to take shelter from the rain in the cavity of their trucks, along with the trash they collected. Two weeks later, the workers began a wildcat strike, carrying signs that read, I am a man. Martin Luther King joined the striking workers in Memphis to support them in March of 1968. After a march erupted in violence, King returned to Memphis a few weeks later, determined to conduct a peaceful rally. The event was scheduled for April 5th. King was gunned down on the 4th. The strike ended on April 16th with a settlement that included union recognition and wage increases. For more, we go to Memphis, where we're joined by two guests. Bill Lucy is former secretary treasurer with AFSCME and played a key role in the 1968 Memphis sanitation worker strike. AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, Municipal Employees, um, the organizers of the strike. He also is president emeritus of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. And H.B. Crockett is with us, one of the striking garbage workers in 1968. He worked for the Memphis Sanitation Department for 53 years before retiring. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Bill Lucy, let's begin with you. Why you went down to Memphis, um, what Dr. King's visit to Memphis not once but twice meant, and what was happening at the time? Well, uh, first of all, Amy, thanks for having, uh, having uh, us on. Uh, Dr. King uh, was in, in the process of or organizing the Poor People's Campaign, uh, really to put a face on poverty across the nation. Uh, the sanitation workers were already in the process of their struggle uh, when the struggle came to the attention of Dr. King, and he clearly uh, understood the struggle, identified with it and uh, gave of his time, energy, and effort to give assistance to the men in their struggle for respect and dignity. And, H.B. Uh, Crockett, could you talk about the conditions that you were facing back then and the importance of the slogan that you chose to symbolize the, the crux of the strike, the I am a man uh, slogan? Yeah, it was really rough back then, Ian. We had to tote that stuff on our head, we had to go in the backyard and get it. Then had to drag the brush out of the backyard, too. And then the supervisor on top of you at all times, looking over the fence, watching to see what you're doing. It just was, really was a terrible thing. It finally got a little better after Dr. King came, after he got messed up. It got a little bit better, not that much. But soon it got a little raised. Wasn't getting no money hardly either. I think. My check went in three weeks with seventy-three dollars. Oh, seventy-three dollars, I believe it was. Not seventy-three, but seventy-three dollars. Every three weeks. That was no money. My rent was thirty-five dollars mm. a month. <laughs> is it true they and said to you, H. B. Crockett? Is it true they said if it's raining, you should just crawl into the cavity of the uh, garbage truck and take refuge there? Yeah, it's true. 
You get it, get it, well, he didn't, they didn't allow you to get out of the rain. I'm going to tell you that right now. He didn't <laughs> allow you to get out of the rain. We, we was on the shed one, one morning, one evening or something, and the man, the supervisor come up there and said, what y'all doing up on this shed? Y'all can't sit up on the shed out of the rain. Y'all got to go, go to work. So we had to come out on the shed and work in the rain. That's for, until they got this thing settled. Then we got it settled, stopped. Stop working in the rain then a little bit. Not much, but stopped a little. You still on your body working, working, work this in, work there, work there. And do uh, Amy, this I mean, this situation re reflected the ultimate contradiction in the uh, the respect that the law provided for workers in this kind of work, as opposed to workers in the private sector who had the right to bargain collectively and participate in decisions that affected their work life. Uh, to not be able to get out of foul weather. And even in this department, you had a situation where some workers would be sent home when it rained, others would remain at work. Those who stayed got a full day's pay, those who went home got no pay. Uh, so for a low-wage worker, uh, a loss of a day's pay was a significant event. And, Bill, Lucy, the importance of being able to organize the union there uh, uh, in Memphis, the, uh, how, what kind of, uh, uh, of support that gave to, to the workers and their conditions. I'm wondering if you could also talk about the two protests. There had been one earlier that had erupted into some kind of violence, and, and uh, Martin Luther King had received some criticism as a result. So when he came back the second time, the importance of his coming back, if you could talk about those two things. Well, in the, in the march that uh, Dr. King had called for, I, I, the date escapes from, I believe, the 18th of March or something like that, uh, clearly was, uh, was uh, the provocateurs caused the level of violence that occurred on that day. Uh, Dr. King clearly was, would, would not participate in any violent march. So he felt obligated to come back and, 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 and support the men again with a march that was nonviolent. Uh, there's all kinds of stories as to what caused the violence. I think I would suggest that some folks read the uh, 1969 Senator Frank Church subcommittee reports to get a sense of what was taking place from the opposition side. Uh, these men were simply men who wanted a, 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 a process by which they could solve their day-to-day -day problems in, uh, in the workplace and have someone who could make decisions that would affect their, their work life. I want to turn back to Dr. King speaking in 1968 in support of the striking sanitation workers in Memphis. And uh, I feel that we can still have a nonviolent demonstration and that we will have a nonviolent demonstration here in Memphis. The important thing is that we are not going to be stopped by mace or by injunctions or any other methods that the city plans to use. And I think they're making a grave mistake because I think this will bring much more support nationally and otherwise to the movement. So that was Dr. King. Um, he comes back for the second march. He gives that famous speech on the night of April 3rd in the rain. Um, hundreds of people, uh, many sanitation workers, their families crowded into the church to hear Dr. King speak. He wasn't even feeling well that night. H.B. Uh, Crockett, were you there? I was there. It was old with. Came home. I was there till it was over, listening to his speech. He gave a great speech. See, I was there for till, till the end. I got home and heard the, heard the news. That was, that was really got me that time. When so, I got home and heard the news. It was the next day, on April 4th, um, in the afternoon, in the late afternoon, that Dr. King was gunned down on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. What was yeah. where were you when you heard that news, and what was your response, both that he had come to be with you and that he had been assassinated there? I believe I was at the, I was at home when I heard on the news. I really should be cut off phone, lights, and everything that night. It was, couldn't couldn't call out, couldn't do nothing. And and Bill Lucy, uh, your. Your response, where you were when you heard the news, and and uh, and the response of you and your union after Martin Luther King was killed. Well, my fellow staffers, uh, Jesse Epps, Joe Paisley, uh, we were at the uh, minimum salary uh, 
building of the AME Church uh, located right next to Cleveland Temple, which essentially was our mobilization office. Uh, we heard the news. We were maybe less than 10 minutes away from the Lorraine Motel. Uh, we immediately headed for the Lorraine Motel, uh, and we were stopped just short of that uh, when we heard the news. I mean, clearly the, the, the assassination had an incredible impact, not just across the city of Memphis, but across the nation as a whole. And H.B. Crockett, what it meant to you that Dr. King came to Memphis and to support your I am a man strike and the significance of those words, I am a man, that, that you carried on the picket signs? Yeah, I had, yeah, we killed a sign. In fact, I got one in my yard now <laughs> saying I am a man. Still in there now. From the other night, we, 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 we went to the meeting. I got one then stuck in my yard. It was, it was a great thing when he came home, when he came here to Memphis. I thought it might be a big change in the world, or some change. Wasn't no great big change, but it was some change in the work position. Amy, could I, could I make a point? Um, so many uh, supporters of the strikers uh, really reflected on the fact that there's, there's really a history in, in, in the African American community about workers, in particular workers of this type. Uh, James Lawson, uh, P.L. Rowe, and other ministers who had supported the strike had often used the phrase uh, to describe the treatment of the men. And I think men sort of all of a sudden realized that they were entitled to respect and dignity, irrespective of the kind of work that they did. So the slogan came out of the recognition that they simply wanted to be treated as men, not as children. Uh, they didn't want to go from boy to uncle to grandpa without ever passing the position of, of being a man. Uh, and when the sign came out, uh, it really hit like a bolt of lightning, because it not only uh, uh, it gave the city sanitation workers recognition, but also across the city, there were other African-American men who had suffered the same kinds of indignities, and that slogan reflected their commitment to being treated as men also. And in that vein, the uh, you went on to become, obviously, one of the most prominent African-American labor leaders in the country, the, uh, the president emeritus of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. The impact of this African-American struggle for dignity and human rights on the overall labor movement, uh, if you could, I'm wondering if you could talk about that as well. Well, let me take something one minute. Dr. King, uh, along with being uh, one of the leading civil rights leaders, was also an incredibly strong advocate for workers' rights. So Dr. King was not doing something new and out of character for him. He was simply saying what he had believed fundamentally all along, that workers were entitled to the right to organize for themselves and have an advocate that spoke to their needs. And uh, his identification with this strike was consistent with his, with his, uh, his, his beliefs. Uh, myself and others who brought whatever assistance we could to this thing were, were doing what we believed also, and that is that workers uh, have a right to have a voice in the decisions that affect their work life, which in turn affects their, 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 their social condition. And here in Memphis, then as well as now, uh, there's a real need for folks to recognize their right to be a part of the, the decision-making process. And, and as you see all these reports now of uh, strikes statewide in West Virginia and Oklahoma and, uh, and now uh, sickened uh, by workers, uh, or sick out by workers in, in uh, Kentucky, your thoughts about the state of the labor movement right now? Ten seconds. Well, the, the labor movement is, is obviously under assault in every respect, but what is really unique and unusual now that you, uh, people are beginning to recognize uh, that they are entitled to live with some degree of dignity and respect. Uh, we have teachers in West Virginia and, and, and across Bill the country. Bill Lucy, we're going to have to leave uh, it have... there, but we'll do part two of our discussion. Post online at democracynm.org. Bill Lucy and H.B. Crockett. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.